on your microphone and, and actually throughout the entire event. Um, if you do wish to leave any messages, you can leave messages through the chat box. Another one? Um, I want to acknowledge, I just want to, I want to acknowledge the staff that helped. This is, this is kind of a, doing a hybrid event is very complicated. Uh, I want to give a, I want to give some special shout outs to Katarina Leiden, our, um, Ida Devine, Masada, Masada Devine, Marilyn Rodriguez, Lisa Moser, uh, and especially Dominic Moret, and Aaron Bilmer, who are helping out, helping with the technical aspects of, the, of this video. I also want to just like give you a kind of a heads up too about upcoming events. Right now we're having Experience is Foundation, which is on view right now until October 2nd. If, you're, if, this, if this is your first time at Tahiti Puerto de Canyon and haven't had a chance to check out Johnny's show, which I'm sure most of you have, it's still up. Um, it will be up till, fr till Friday, actually October 1st. Um, usually, if this wasn't the pandemic, will be uh, the last days on a Saturday. On October 22nd, um, there's going to be an exhibition of, of Marina Gutierrez, um, Another World Exists, which is going to which is going to be a view for about two months. And if you want to know about more of upcoming events or become a member, please visit us at, at uh, tayerpr.org. Um, this ex this talk. Ayer, um, Ayer y hoy, a conversation with Carmen and Johnny, um, is very special for us. I think from in, when, when Johnny first came, an opportunity to have an exhibition here at Taller Puerto de Kenya, and knowing that this is going to be the last year for Carmen as executive director of Taller Puerto de Kenya, that this, this, this is something we need to take advantage of, um, because they represent the second phase of Taller. Uh, they, they were together, and with Luis Hernandez, who you're going to met, who helped who helped uh, um, bring back Taller Puerto de Kenya right there, they represent the second phase of Taller, um, and which ultimately led to this building which we're all, stand we're all, which we're all standing in. So I'm gonna give you, the, the conversation's gonna last about 90 minutes. At approximately about 4.30, we'll, we will break out into first a testimonial, where we'll be asking um, a few people to come up here and, maybe, and, leave, some, uh, and, and, and leave their impressions on the mic. Um, and then we're going to start off with a Q&A at the very end. Um, there will, we've left with, on, the, on the chairs you will find pieces of paper with pencils. We ask you to leave your questions um, that you may want for, the, for, for our panelists here to, to answer. Uh, these qu your notes if, and on the chat boxes there, those questions would be collected and then submitted to our panelists to answer later the, during the Q&A session. Um, So, without any further ado, I would just like to introduce you to Luis Hernandez. Uh, Luis Hernandez, um, with Carmen and, and Johnny Rosari, he's been fundamental for to bringing back Taya Puerto Rico. Um, so, um, without any more time, um, please, Luis, if you can come in. Because uh, this is a conversation, as we say in the title, una conversación. In Spanish, we say conversación, plática, charla. I say can, beautiful words in Spanish for the, the same idea of uh, exchanging information, feelings, uh, talking among friends. And when Carmen called me to to ask me if I wanted to moderate the, the activity. Of course, I said yes. I've been involved with Taller since uh, maybe 1975 when I came to Philadelphia. So Carmen and I, we shared a lot of uh, history associated with Taller. The same with Johnny. And it's, uh, you see the combination of private history combined with group history because I came to Philadelphia to study at Penn. Uh, I'm from Aguasuena, Puerto Rico. I grew up there, I studied there. And I came to Philly and then I decided that school wasn't what I wanted to do at that time. And then I met Carmen through a common friend, near Norma Rivera, a doctor. 
and we just clicked. And Carmen, uh, she mentions that the first activity, you're gonna see it in the video, that she attended sponsored by Taller was a concert. She forgot that we attended that concert together. <laughs> and that concert was by El Topo, Antonio Caban Valley. We hear about the concert. It was at St. Ambrose Church on 6th and Venango. And we talked to the organizers and then we got involved. We said, we want to be volunteers. And the activity was sponsored by Taller Puerto Riqueño then. Well, maybe two or three months later, we heard rumors that uh, Taller was, something was happening that the organization might disappear. We got a telephone call from another friend who said, let's all go together because if we don't rescue Taller, it will be quite a stain on our uh, community, you know, funders and all that. We attended the emergency meeting, and at that meeting, Carmen became the new president of the board. <laughs> and then at one point, uh, we said, well, we need to do something to create a splash so that uh, the, uh, the community will know that we're still here. They didn't know that financially, and it was very, the organization wasn't in good shape. And we organized the Feria del Barrio, and the first one we had was at Hunting Park on a Sunday with a big banner from Taller. You know, we were in a way pretending that the organization was still uh, in good shape. Well, it took off and Carmen became president. We all got involved. But before uh, we continue, you know, the, the title said Ayer y Hoy, Yesterday and Today. And at this point, I would like to thank and honor those young Puerto Rican young men and women who back in 1974 created the organization that we are celebrating today. Think about that, 1974 to 2021, and we're still here. <laughs> we're still here. You see the picture behind me? You can see Domingo Negro. You can see a lot of uh, young people. Some of them already passed, so we need to really honor that struggle, which shows also it wasn't Puerto Ricans from the, we call it El Charco, from the other side of the pond that were, it was Puerto Rican, second generation Puerto Rican who organized Taller Puerto Rican. And it was uh, members of ASPIRA, it started as an ASPIRA program, and they became a graphic shop uh, program that was at Fifth End, I think it was Venango, no Julia? And, you know, silk screening, t-shirts, uh, doing, uh, and it was a time of effervescence in the whole country. It was communities who had been ignored claiming their place and saying we're here. It was a time of the young lords. It was a time of the Black Panthers. It was a time of uh, people saying, you need to count us too. And that was the beginning of Taller Puerto Riqueño. And also the beginning of more and more nonprofit organizations caring about the Puerto Rican community, the Latino community, and that's the struggle that we also want to celebrate today. And Carmen and Johnny are good examples of dedicated hard workers. I mean, Carmen can say today, mission accomplished. And Johnny, is we're saying welcome back home. He's, he wasn't the prodigal son, but he has now an exhibit in our gallery. So it's like joining and, and saying thanks to the hard struggle, the challenges, and the celebration that we're having today. That your Puerto Riqueño is here in this nice building, but that was a storefront 
that uh, at this point I think of Doña Carmen Puigdoyer. She was a Puerto Rican poet who was, uh, she came from New York and she was in that transition too of keeping Taller alive. Then we moved to the building on Fifth and Lehigh. Then we opened the building on Fifth and Huntington across the street and then here. So let's say thank you to the whole line of community workers, members who have this organization still here. I would like to uh, invite on stage the two honorees that they said in Contes and all that of this event because we're going to have a conversation. Later, we're going, you're going to have a, uh, uh, an opportunity to also share uh, your responses and your ideas and what Tayir means to you. So now I would like Carmen and Johnny to join us on stage. And we have two videos, uh, one with Johnny, one with uh, Carmen. Let's uh, watch the videos and then uh, the conversation will continue. Muy bien. My connection with Taller goes back a long time. And I started as a part-time teacher in art. And then I volunteered a lot. When they moved to that new building on Fifth and Lehigh, there was a chance for them to finally hire a director. And Carmen Febo asked me if I wanted to take the opportunity and uh, became the director, made a chance to build a staff, build a, a programmatic base inspired on the history of Taller already as a printmaking center and a cultural center and as the only cultural center bringing in live art from Puerto Rico. I worked with Taller about 12 years and and then I would move on to my secondary vision, which has always been teaching and education. Ganming, after I was hired, gave me a page of 33 items of things that didn't need to be done within the first year of me working at Tayel. And it included any, everything from sending the reports to NEA after they did those amazing oral history projects. And that was in the 70s when Domingo Negron was director. And everything from selling the old building. So everything that I didn't know how to do. So it was a little bit of everything, you know? I would try to address a community crisis out there. And I had the, the Puerto Rican tradition of you clean your street every day, right? So we would always take turns, like sweeping that part of the street. One time, this truck showed up and they had thrown trash all over Tayen. And this was a commercial about would you do this to your mother, was the slogan, right? About trash in the city. And they had to bring trash. And I, and I went crazy, you know. I told the guy, no, no, you can't do this. How are you gonna bring trash to a place that we literally clean every morning? One thing that we, the board and the staff were sure of is that we wanted to start big, right? So we started inviting major artists from Puerto Rico, Lorenzo Mal, master printmaker, uh, Tufino, uh, Rafael Tufino, Mirna Baez, which was the first major artist we bought. All those artists are so humble, even though they're super famous. And, you know, we started bringing in performing groups and things like that that we had from connections, including a connection that we had made when I went to San Francisco and visited the Mission Cultural Center and they were exhibiting the 20 year history of Santana and Santana is what I, you know, one of my favorite musicians, right? So they told me, why don't you, you know, take the show, you know? And we connected with the Santana PR people and brought it in Santana with himself and his brother Malo. We started a prison program. We would tell all the writers and artists that it, when they came, they had two responsibilities that they had to agree to. One is to work directly with the kids 
that we have at the center, and the second is to do a prison visit with us. And we are connected with the city prisons and Greaterford and state prisons and taking artists with Latinx, you know, uh, prisoners. So we built a relationship, started teaching a course at Greaterford. We did a lot of projects around AIDS. At that time, our community was not only losing, we had lost already a few of the Latinx artists that, that were members. We brought in Pregones, they did a whole month residency, brought in theater groups from Puerto Rico, and they did residencies from that emerge, so smaller theater companies that emerged in Philly, but they did amazing work. And we brought theater artists from all over the state to do a one-week residency with these theater specialists. But we did bring in artists and did great great theater work and poetry readings. So I, I will come back with a, a, a Santana story. <laughs> see, I love stories. That's what you see in the work here, right? We had to give out tickets. It was free to go in the gallery and see the show, and Santana was there, right? So lines will form outside every hour. We asked them, hey, Santana, you know, it's getting late. It's past the time the exhibition are closed. And he didn't leave until the last person, he shook hands with the last person. So then the next day, we did a very early press conference so all the news people can get them. And they all came. You know, probably the first time we were able to get all the media for a positive thing in North Philly. And one of the interviewers asked him exactly what you asked me. In one sentence, tell us what this experience is, you know? And Santana said, I'm not giving you the one bite. It's too big to give you the one minute bite, you know? You're gonna have to cut a lot if you want, but I'm gonna say what I wanna say. And I'm not telling you I'm gonna do that, but I would say if I were gonna break it down, I would say it was just a, such a unique opportunity to grow as a, as a person, as a cultural worker, as an artist. I always felt like working at Tallinn, you had to be an artist, right? You had to constantly be thinking, and it was the most incredible thing in my life. I've been the executive director since 2001, and as the executive director of a small not-for-profit organization, I do a little bit of everything. We need to oversee all the programs, oversee all the finances, oversee all the fundraising, make sure everything is operating properly, and do troubleshooting for problems. I was trained as a, as a physician. My reason to come into Philadelphia was to, to train, to do a residency, a specialization in family medicine. And very soon after I came, um, I heard about a concert that was happening at Taller uh, by a Puerto Rican singer and composer I knew very well. It was uh, the sounds, the rhythms, the smells of the food, the camaraderie, the speaking Spanish, the uh, the connecting to other Puerto Ricans and, and other Latin American uh, people in that room. It was being home, right? Very soon after, I you know, started to learn more about the organization and what it was about, and got involved, became volunteer, and then became a board member. So that's how I got connected to Taller. I think that my attraction to the organization and to the work and to the principles of Taller comes because of my upbringing. Culture was very, very, very important to my family. Both to my, my mother, who was a Spanish teacher, she was connected to literature, and my father, who loved music, I think made a connection to me about loving it and about how important it is. I see Taller as a hub, as a center, um, that connects to our Puerto Rican and Latino heritage, and that connects to our creativity, our past, our identity as, uh, as cultural beings, but also celebrating in the present with aspirations towards the future. A symbol of how Taller impacts community, you know, is represented by this story I'm gonna share. Many years ago, we were still in the old building and a huge heart was being created in its door as part of the facade of the building. People would stop in front of the heart, touch the heart and touch their heart. 
presence of Taller in this community, you know, represents that sense of what Taller means to people in terms of a place, you know, that connects to their heart, to their culture, to who they are, to their heritage. Taller has had throughout its history quite a bit of financial struggles. Learning that the second two and a half million dollars <laughs> for the building, you know, had been approved by the Pennsylvania legislature and that therefore the dream of a new space uh, was moving forward. But at that moment, it felt to me at least, the dice are cast and we can, you know, aspire to have this project finished. Taller right now is in a very good place. The building in a way underscored our ability to get this huge project and, and follow our path for continued progress and development of the organization. And that has given us some additional recognition and credibility and that has strengthened Taller's standing in its community and the community at large. I want people to feel that this is their center, that this is their space, that this creates a comfortable place to be and to celebrate who they are. That's the old building storefront, building back the organization, reconstruir la organización. Uh, Carmen said at one point uh, that uh, excuse me, of the challenges that Tayet has had of uh, building back after all that, uh, you know, at the beginning I mentioned uh, that first phase that Taller almost collapsed and that you joined Taller and Taller. What that challenge and the others, how do you think they affected Taller and how Taller was able to, to come out of those challenges? <clears throat> I think that you described uh, that, that moment, um, you know, so, so during that, First year, Taller, you know, uh, is established and it starts doing a lot of programming, and then um, it it falls into a, a phase of um, kind of regression, where uh, a switching of uh, directorship and a number of other things, and then lost funding. And in 1984, I come back from. Puerto Rico um, after spending there um, about five years. And we get the call from uh, <laughs> Socorro. Uh, Carmen, if we don't uh, start getting together, Taller is going to disappear because there was no program. The board of directors had disbanded. Um, and, uh, you know, there was no leadership to, to, to figure out what to do in that moment of crisis. And we maybe 25, 30 people came together, out of which um, a board was constructed. You know, everybody stepped back and I was left <laughs> up front <laughs> in, a <laughs> in a way. Anyway, um, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, 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 it's a joke, but it's really not, not a joke. Taller benefits from luck from being in the right place at the right time from um you know from yeah consistency leadership and so on and so forth but um if we would have not had for example an An angel ortiz in city council at that moment when we reorganized and there was no funding we wouldn't have had funding to hire you uh, to to be the manager of the store really the manager of the building, and allow us the opportunity with volunteers like Johnny to create a gallery on the second floor. So there we were with programming around, around the year because we could establish 
shows that would last three or four months or whatever, whatever and with volunteer help, switch it and do another show. <laughs> and, and we had somebody that was managing the store on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, that was the beginning. And that was part of the strategic thinking that we did um, to try to figure out what are the steps we need to do in order to continue to, op to open up. Because it was exhibition, we were able to attract attention from the National Endowment for the Arts. And then, and then slowly others, and you know, William Penn Foundation was very interested in, um, because they had um, provided funding for the building, they wanted you know, that building to be utilized. So they were very instrumental in providing funding to hire the first executive director, which was Johnny. So we opened the, the building, <coughs> uh, you know, that had barely been renovated um, with funding that had been provided by William Penn Foundation, hired you like in, you know, June, July, and then by November we had funding to, John to, to hire Johnny as the first executive director, and then the rest is history. Johnny was an excellent executive director for 12 years. Programming started to come out. <laughs> And now that uh, you reminded me of something that you should know uh, about, about those years, uh, Carmen mentioned, you know, you need uh, Ivan Ortiz and him being at the city council. Those connections and that background, how does it affect, you know, funding for organizations like Tayyip? Because years later, I was a program officer at the Philadelphia Foundation. You don't have an idea how many times foundations look at the work of organizations like Tayyip and they don't understand the role of an arts institution in a community like ours. I remember defending, they said, oh, that's not art, that's social work. And I said, I'm sorry, the work that Tayyip does does include social work because of the community that we're working in and it doesn't diminish the work that the year does. Art is not, that social work component comes with the creature, and we need to respond to that. So, I mean, I think that, that um, Johnny can then talk about those first years with him as executive director and the 37 things on the list that we put down <laughs> for, for him to do, <laughs> that he so, <laughs> so ably <laughs> completed uh, but that you know that was a year of Here, that was Juliana, of a lot of uh, Fury and soul for programming developing new programming and uh, Johnny take it uh, take it over so you need, yeah go ahead Johnny oh okay <laughs> so yeah can I mention the famous hello oh. I did something wrong there no <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> By the way, I'm not taking it off because I'm a little sick and I don't, yeah, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yes, that list. And the list is, is extremely important because I wanted to start with Carmen in particular, right? And her leadership, um, just the fact that she took the huge risk of hiring me. I had just come out of art school. I was a young father. Uh, married to a great woman who doesn't feel too well, so she didn't come. Um, and, and we were thinking about moving to New York where my family was concentrated at that time. And w I had a job and volunteering at the end. Come and tells me, you wanna apply? You know, and almost telling me, I'll fight for you. <laughs> and then sh I would say that those toes were years were of coming fighting for me, like making sure that, that I was supported. Uh, she took me to foundations. That list included things like final reports to National Endowment for the Great Oral History Project that the, the early administration of Tayel had done, um, which if you don't know, check it out in the, in the archives. And, and, and she was consistent, right? She, will always come up and show up, know when to like, on los frenos on me, you know, she knew how to tell me, whoa, 
oh, you know, that ain't going to work, and take it easy, you know, and, but never, never in front of anybody else. Like, she'll come from 8 o'clock at night looking, you know, taking pa patients from 6 in the morning uh, to sit with me and talk about, okay, so what's our next step? She took me to a foundation, and they told her, well, you hired somebody with no experience, so we, we're still not going to fund you, and and Calmin, you know, I saw it in action. I saw Calmin in action, right, for the first time, and I learned a lot. You know, she said, wait a minute. Wait, Calmin, un momentito. Un momentito. Un momentito. Um, and put them in their place and said, no, you said hire an executive director. This is the one we chose. So what they did was they funded a project to go around the country, and I was able to make a meet leaders from the Guadalupe Cultural Center in San Antonio, the Caribbean Center, Marta Moreno Vega, and Pedro Rodriguez, you know, from the Guadalupe, um, in New York, Pregones, uh, the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater, the great Miriam Colón, when she was in police, and Rosalba, and the whole crew, you saw them on their Mexican Museum in Chicago, Carlos Tortorero, who was an educator and a fighter. He took me those few days I was in Chicago, he said, all of them told me, don't, don't spend money on a hotel. You don't have that. You know, give me, you know, stay in my house, and then you just follow me around. And I learned so much. Like, I met Maya Angelo, Henry Cisneros in San Antonio. I met all kinds of great reader, uh, writers and visual artists in Chicago. And Carlos was a fighter. He was an educator. He also took me to a few foundation meetings where I went like, oh, I got to do that. But um, it was in Juana Guzman, and um, the Mission Cultural Center in San Francisco led to the Grace Santana exhibition. Uh, Julia at that time was the director of the gallery. Uh, Doris Noguera, who's here, was also one of the directors of the gallery. Um, and, you know, okay, so let me move on. So that Santana exhibit was, you know, groundbreaking. The trip to the Mission Cultural Center not only led to the Santana, uh, exhibit that Julia then followed up with um, in Macla in San Jose and then New York um, and Boston, uh, Villa Sin Miedo, yeah, and, and it was just amazing. So Pregones said, why don't we just do a Ruta Panoramica? And we included, well, they included, and I think it was funded by one of the large ones, Ford or Rockefeller. Um, and it included artists from Puerto Rico, institutions from Puerto Rico, from Philly, Tayel, and Amla, and then in New York, Traveling Theater, and Pregones, and a few others, and then in Boston, not only Villa Sin Miedo, uh, but the Betances community that they defended. They had a radio station, they had all kinds of stuff, they were doing social work. Anyway, so that's where I picked up on all that, right? And I, I learned so much during that time, and then that, oh, and the last, that partner in Puerto Rico, and that's a long story, but the Institute of Culture family did partner with us, and that started for us, La Feria del Libro y Artesanías, mm -hmm. which always brought master uh, artisans from Puerto Rico to, uh, the Mission Cultural Center connected us to their major printmaking workshop, led by a famous Chilean mm -hmm. uh, printer, which last night and today, I forgot his name, I'm I'm sorry, um, but we were able to send artists to do prints. Actually, Doris was yeah. one of the artists that went and, and learned on the, uh, yeah. No, one of the activities that you mentioned, it's celebrating 25 years this year of Schumber uh, Symposium, and 25 years, it's still going on, celebrating the African contribution to Puerto Rican culture and the connections. And now we're gonna hear from Evelyn Perot, who was the organizer of, uh, of the event, who's now teaching history at the University of California in Santa Barbara, but for many years she worked at Tayid, and she was a key person to develop the organization that Johnny mentioned before. And it's uh, one of the unique events that Tayid organized every year. So let's hear from Evelyn. Hello, um, the story 
of an event would be difficult for me to say because I worked with Johnny at Taller for uh, two years almost. And uh, however, working with him, working at Taller was instrumental not only uh, to create the annual Arturo Chamber Symposium at Taller, but to everything else that I've done in my life. And so I, I remain extremely thankful for those years working with Johnny work, and for all the years I've been connected to Taller, dreaming and putting together this amazing event called uh, the Annual Arturo Chamber Symposium. Thank you. Bye-bye. That was Evelyn Pearl. Gracias, Heavenly. Evelyn mentioned uh, one of the ways Tayet res uh, respond to uh, our needs. But I remember, I have to tell you, uh, those moments when the work you do is like an epiphany. One of those moments that you never forget. Something that happened that you said, wow. This, in a way, captures why we're doing what we're doing. I want Johnny to go back. He will remember this because, I mean, for me, it was one of those moments that I say, wow. It happened maybe 15 years ago. To, I still remember that day when we were getting ready to open the building, um, Fifth and Lehigh. We were pretending that we have plenty of books and craft and all that. We were displaying all the books full front to hide the fact that we didn't have that many books. But and Lu the books but Luis, look so nice. Luis, and Luis, let me correct you. Not 15 years ago, honey. How many? <laughs> Something like 25 or 30. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, that's true. And we're getting ready, you know, to have the building. That was. And luckily, I got a Fells Fellowship, and that summer I was able to work at that year because I got a Fells Fellowship. So then Johnny came, and I remember getting the place ready with boxes on the floor and all that, and I remember two Puerto Rican kids looking through the front glass door. You know, that building has, what's this sign by somebody who, it looks like an architecture firm front or a law office, it's that kind of glass. And so they were going like this. And I went, you know, come in. They came in. They started looking. And, and they asked me, you know, what do you do here? And I, had, I started talking to them. And I remember when I was talking about the books, I remember that their eyes just went. And I said, in a way, I said, books written about people like me? And by people like me, and in a way I could see that that moment they realized that they didn't start from point zero, that there was a history behind them, that the community has books. I mean, books are sacred. Book is like the word, you know, the Bible. And I remember I wrote a, about this in a weekly column that I used to write for Community Focus, a paper that we had at that time. And I remember that when Johnny read it, he came to me, he said, Luis, you mentioned that. And for me, it's like uh, I'm learning again. He said, that is just, he said, let's keep doing what we're doing. Because you even wrote a remember, I don't know if you remember that column and that when I mentioned it to you. Those two kids, I still remember, I can still see them. Do you have moments like, when you mentioned the seeing people touching the mural on the, the mosaic uh, mural outside, and you said that people used to touch the heart and then touch their hearts. And by the way, that mural hasn't been painted on. That mural still looks the same. People respect that mural like, no problem. It hasn't been painted or whatever. Do you have remember moments like that that you said, wow, I'm, I have to do this. So real quick, um, yeah, there were like the whole 12 years <laughs> were moments like that. You know, um, 
Every day I learned, you know, every day the people one taught really, me. One that really well, you know, shaking you. Um, I guess I can, you know, I was going to talk about the importance of collaborations and how nothing happens in this community with, with our partners. Uh, and that includes organizations in our community that also Puerto Rican Latinx organizations, but also outside multicultural organizations, citywide institutions, and national, right? Like I spoke about NALAC, the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, that yet got so involved that the first conference of uh, bookstores, of Latinx-owned bookstores and cultural centers, was held at the Puerto Riqueño, and that was a national event like one of the national events for NALAC and one definitely for us. And it was an amazing experience. But I think some of the other ones were, you know, when we moved to this building across the street, um, it was, you know, we had these two buildings, so that was my workout 30 times a day back and forth. Um, but the, we went down the street and up the street giving out flyers, telling people what we're gonna do there. And you know, the moms and pops started coming in telling me, oh, this is what's going on, this is this, this is this. And then I learned about the wisdom, the huge wisdom that's in our people that live in this community. And then the pain that they've gone through, right? We had a volunteer, a woman that was also the block captain of 4th Street across the park. And she had lost, she had I think, over 10 kids um, and had lost about nine of them. So she was now raising their kids, her grandchildren, those were the ones that were coming. Afro African American woman that, that had, and then she told me her life story and it was like, you know, wow. You know, that was a wow moment, right? And then the mothers from the block said, look, Every year, we have this haunted house in my house, and all these kids come in, you know, because I just need them out of the street. And, and, she's, and I said, so you're proposing? And she said, yep, I'm proposing that we move it to, to the building, to the taller, and we'll help you. We're not going to leave you alone. And artists, I started calling artists and stuff, and they all came in. The, they designed this amazing haunted house in the first floor, and then they they became they came in all dressed up and you know theater style, right? All of them and terrify the kids. Um, and then the mothers upstairs would receive them. Give we would give them a ticket when they came in, and they could pick up candy and hot dogs and all that. They didn't have to go trick or treating and risk their lives out there, you know. Um, so that was one ha, ha moment, right? The Thanksgiving luncheon, remember those mm -hmm. and that you continue to do? Yeah, and um, the work that we did in prisons and the relationships that we established with prisoners in not only um, by bringing artists, residencies, every time there was an artist at that, uh, point at that yet, but over there, um, we would also take them to a prison and do a workshop. That was Holmesburg, when Holmesburg was still open, Greaterford, the city prisons, et cetera. Um, another I have moment real quick is, you know, La Ruta Parne Marica I talked about was the development of YAP, remember? Um, and, and that still goes on today, the idea of preparing, and that was Gil Gonzalez, who was the first director, and then Jasmine Hernandez, who lives in Puerto Rico, um, and, huh? Damari was the director of YAP? Yeah, later. Oh, Cap. Oh, later, yeah, after, later. I, after, you left. after I left. Okay, yes. That's Carmen's part. <laughs> but thank you, Doris. By the way, one of the aha moments was Doris. Uh, we went to the School of the Blind in Philly, all the way up there in Germantown. And I was supposed to give a Hispanic Heritage Month lecture. Um, and it's interesting because I can't hear one now. And I, l I walked around the school. They told me, you can walk around and see what we do. And, you know, just watching the kids and their facial expressions. And, you know, and I'm not hearing a sound except the movement of their clothes and their hands and some of them talking because they could read each other's lips. So when I went to do the presentation, the teacher looks at me and she goes, you're talking too Puerto Rican fast. You know, you cannot, you know, you, you ha they're reading your lips. You, you don't know how to sign, and I can't keep up with you, right? So anyway, so we ended up with a great relationship, invited them over, Doris did a workshop, and this is probably one of the most emotional moments I had at, at Tayel. 
Um, Dori has had them work with uh, flex tubes, you know, those little fuzzy things. Um, and there was one kid, the teachers kept redirecting and sitting him down. And then I finally, you know, Dori's one like, you know, take care of this kid so I can continue my work. Um, so I sat next to him and we just hit it off, right? And, and then at the end he wouldn't leave and the teacher kept calling him, banging on the wall and all that, and the bus was waiting, and then he runs up to me and he gives me these two little figures, and I couldn't find them. Just like I couldn't find the list, I, I tore my house apart, and my house ain't that big as you know. Um, so anyway, I couldn't find it. And, but he gave me these two little figures that I carried even to my job at the University of Penn. Right, and it was amazing. He had created these two little men, and they sat on chairs. They sat, I, everywhere I put them, they would sit on my co on my coffee cup, on my plants in the office. I always have plants in the office. Anyway, so the last one is the AIDS project, mm -hmm. and I don't know. You know, you were very well. Everybody was very involved. Juan David Acosta. If you don't know him, you need to meet him. He was. Anyway, he put together uh, a collaboration uh, with us, Congreso, APM, and a few other organizations, and they provided all the AIDS educators, and then we provided the kids. Uh, Catalina Ramos, uh, Rios, pardon, uh, worked as, you know, the, the literary, and they created, um, I brought some samples. Um, they created comic books that you can buy out front, and and in bilingual format that were then distributed in schools. They created posters and, and you know, I'm gonna put all this out over here later when you all have a minute, you wanna look through stuff, don't take anything. Um, and then, and then you know, so we did a number A, we did posters, but one good story from the, po the banner project. He loves to tell stories. <laughs> you wanna stop and then? No, no. Termina, yeah. Okay, Finish. so they, they, we did the banners, I'm sorry, <laughs> and, and there were five banners, the educators were, it was a long process, right, of doing things with kids, finally the five centers, Congreso, APM, whatever, uh, Tayel, and two others, I can't remember the last ones, I don't know. Anyway, but the, we created these banners, um, you know, about AIDS and, you know, the, the crisis was really hitting our community. I just want to mention that we lost one of our great uh, theater artists, Roberto Hernandez, um, and out of the little money that he left, he left $3,000 to La Casa Latina, I mean, <laughs> to Taller Puerto Riqueño, to build the sound system of the ad hoc theater we had, um, and that was part of the Cuatro Gatos Theater Company and all that. Um, and then, you know, we worked with graffiti artists, and, you know, they made me stay there till three or four or five in the morning, well, because that's when they work, um, and then took me around and put me in basements and where, you know, there were graffiti uh, battles going on and all this stuff, and never mind Pelea de Gallo, you know, this was like, graffiti style kind of people deciding who won. It meant a lot in that block. Uh, but this poster, and that's uh, uh, Sandra Andino, if you don't know her photography, she was doing her, her PhD. Uh, this is the poster that we did it. We did it with Folklore Project. Mm -hmm. So anyway, those are some of the many. <laughs> Sorry. Let's hear from a community member who respond to that year's uh, contribution, uh, this person sent us this uh, testimony saying how of Tayyid and what Tayyid means to him. Let's hear it. Tayyid has a very special place in my heart. It has and continues to nurture and sustain my identity as a Puerto Rican for more than three decades living in Philadelphia. I have seen it grow and I along with it. I am so grateful today and always for the warm reception I experience when I visit or attend an event, for the diversity of programs, exhibits, and more for everyone's enjoyment. But best of all, I am humbled and grateful to the dedicated staff. I admire each and all of you for your passion and love for the arts. 
Hats off to you. Congratulations. Muchas gracias. Talking about passion, that's a key. We it couldn't do our work. You saw your. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, we uh, couldn't do the work we do with that one key element, passion. You saw it in Johnny? How <laughs> remembering all those programs and events and we need passion and I think we follow uh, the dictum of a Puerto Rican poet who by the way is from my town, I was Buenos, one of the uh, New Yorican poets from New York, Victor Hernandez Cruz, and he said, think with your body and dance with your mind. And that, I always remember that as a way of saying, this is a principle that we follow. Think with your body and dance with your mind. And we show it, I mean, we need passion to do the work that we do. What, uh, you mentioned before the crisis in the community and how Tayer respond to, uh, to the, because I think of Tayer too as a hub of not only the programs that you run, but also how Tayer has been key in uh, helping, assisting new groups and people working, artists in the city. Uh, you mentioned the AIDS crisis, and I remember uh, the documentary uh, that Francis Negro and Alba Martinez did about the, the AIDS crisis. What was the title of the Eso No Me Pasa Mi, That Doesn't Happen To Me? That was, that documentary has been shown in many festivals, and that was in a way, Taller being the hub for that project to take place. I heard of other artists who said, I wouldn't be here because of the work Taller gave me the opportunity to work through them. So how do you see the work of Taller presently as uh, addressing community needs? <coughs> you know, we, we see Taller is, a, is an integral part of the community, and, and as you were saying earlier, Luis, um, you know, it's, it's art with a purpose, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's celebrating the, the richness and the beauty and the quality of the art that our artists do, but it is also integrating the issues that impact our community. So in our education programs, it's not social work, it's teaching them art, but it's teaching them art that teaches leadership, that teaches working together, that teaches um, um, you know, learning socialization skills. Um, each each uh, year has a particular theme that relates to something that is happening. For example, this year, of course, it's been resilience um, other years uh, during the AIDS crisis, it's, it was about how you know how to protect yourself. So, so you know we see we see art as you know in a way not art for art's sake, but art as an integral part of who we are as individuals. And and therefore, um, you know when when Maria happened, Taller was there to raise money and to provide space and to do whatever it was that we needed to do in order to to help with that. And, you know, the, the, the Latino community here in Philadelphia collected over $450,000 to send to Puerto Rico and, and more uh, because there were food and, yeah, there, there was food and there were, you know, arrangements that, um, you know, the Office of Maria Quinones did, for example, to, to transport uh, all of those goods to Puerto Rico. So you know, with the census and the issues that, you know, of undercounting, we, you know, we try to, to, to help promote and to, and, and to provide uh, the, the facility for, for education programs and workshops, um, for voting, for, um, um, so any, any issue and every issue that impacts the community, we are there as a partner and, and we, you know, we do it you know, with art, or we do it just by, you know, metiendo mano, <laughs> like, you know, like, uh, you know, just being in the, in the middle of it. Um, the, 
you know, one of the shows that happened uh, right after Maria was a was a, an installation project that artists from that had visit been in Puerto Rico and visited Puerto Rico during during the storm and after the storm uh, brought images of that and presented a, a project. Uh, you know, in our gallery, so it, it's it's connected to to issues that happen um, that happen here and, and to which we respond. The AIDS project that that, that was mentioned, the work in the prison. Um, yeah. So I have I've, I wanted to reminisce a little bit about you know the some of the work that that was responding to the educational crisis, and as you all know you know, the statistics, so I don't want to go over them right now. Um, but we at Taller, uh, at that time, this, you know, the school district, what's the word? The word is word, but if they, they messed up in, in a curriculum guide that they prepared um, around Puerto Rico. And I remember sitting around and reading, and every, every time we'd go like, Samba is not from Puerto Rico, Samba is from Brazil. You know, este, cuchifri, you know, what was it? Este, tacos were mainstream Puerto Rican dishes. And anyway, so they missed it up, right? They probably got one generalist and he just came up with every Latino culture and he poured it into the Puerto Ricans. And I said, I wish I can take credit for all that, but no. That's for my brothers and sisters in the in the Americas, right? So what they we started this whole thing. We did a protest. We called the media. Angel Ortiz started protesting all over the city, and and then the superintendent uh, at that time, um, Constance Creighton, who was actually an amazingly beautiful person, um, but you know, she has control no control over what comes out some of the time, and, and that came out. So we got interviewed and whatever, and then we decided, okay, you know what, the only way to respond to this is by one, saying, because she called me and she said, okay, how do we make this up? Just stay off the TV and how do we make this up? Um, and I said, well, great, we'll talk. We, we developed the Adopt the School program. They developed the Adopt the School and then Tayel adopted three. Roberto Clemente, Paro Thomas, and Ferro, I think it was. I don't know, Marilyn, you, yeah, Ferro. Um, and all those projects were done with kids from those schools. Cynthia Alvarez became, who is a bilingual, the first bilingual special ed uh, teacher in Philadelphia District. Mind you, she's still young, so, you know, <laughs> they were way behind. Anyway, and Cynthia, don't play. Right, she was one of those teachers where you know kids were jumping all over the world. Similar, like Edwin has told me, you know, when he walks into the classroom, you know, they say, you know, relax. Um, Cynthia would have that control. Um, Cynthia became our first museum teacher. That's how they made it up. And um, and then Maria Mills Torres, who continues to be an amazing volunteer, right, and all that stuff. But I wanted to mention one other collaboration. It's okay to see. <laughs> sure. um, and that was the collaboration of big building communities. And it started through an effort that Julia started, which was when the quincentennial was going to be celebrated. Philadelphia planned all this great thing to celebrate colonization. Um, and then did, you know, put up a, a huge sto uh, sculpture of Delaware Indian that's still there on Second, and I hope it's still there, on Second and Market, and then changed the name of Delaware Avenue to Columbus Avenue. Um, and did that famous, uh, whatever that thing is, bad sculpture, um, that's, um, as from a sculptor, I could say it's a bad sculpture. Um, and. And then somebody came along and threw like 10 gallons of red paint on it, you know? So not that we did, we did not do that, but, um, and, and I just wanted to say one more collaboration and that was the speaking in around tons. That was the response. So we worked with 50 uh, Latinx and African-American and another multicultural group of artists, musicians, performances, and we put together this exhibit in Cantor uh, Quincentennial, and we were the only exhibit in the city that countered the Quincentennial celebration. 
Uh, the same thing happened with the quotes, but then later on, the seniors decided to keep the quotes and show them around Philadelphia, and I think Taller still has them in the, in the thing, and... Uh, yeah, to that little guy sitting right next to you. <laughs> um, anyway, so these artists, Doris was involved, these artists met for about a year, remember? And then we ended up with a huge opening and a, and a parranda bembe going down Fifth Street over to the theater. And then, then we had performances for our living 11 p.m. But the important thing was the relationships that were built, right? From that, uh, the Coalition of African American and Latinx Organizations, Jesse Bermudez and me joined Estayel and Amla. And it was started by John Allen, and he rests in peace. And John Allen is the founder of the Freedom Theater. Um, and he wanted to see something between, yeah, between the, uh, the Latino and the African American community. And we were forceful. And I'm almost sure there hasn't been anything like that since. Um, and even when I run into the oh, older, very old, directors of the other uh, centers, you know, every once in a while, we all reminisce and we go like, wow, we were a power force. We went into Pew and the director of the African American Museum, she sat there and she gave him the rundown. We had planned, but she like took off. And I could see the nervousness arising. Um, anyway, so those kind of beautiful things are the kind of things that you know, when they asked you if you keep a, a blade on the young Yeah, head. I remember being uh, being called at, uh, getting this telephone call, and somebody from a theater company in Center City said, uh, excuse me, sir, how do you say switch blade in Spanish? I said, oh, really? Switch blade. Like Navaja, the gangs, you know, with the switch blade. And it's, uh, you know, the stereotypes and just how you respond to them too, and the lack of information is just amazing. You mentioned the collaborations, and when I was working at the foundation, uh, a group of us started also promoting that a good way to help not only with funding, but also to increase the presence of a minority arts organization was to work together. And that's how we also try to fund more projects that involve the African American Museum with Tayer and that kind of collaboration. The association also with other Latino uh, cultural organizations like AMLA, the Asociación de Músicos Latinoamericanos. And there is another testimonial that I will, that a good friend of ours sent that I would like you to, to listen to. Let's play the, and some of you will recognize the voice and he will identify himself. So. Hi, my name is Tony Rocco, and uh, I run a nonprofit organization in the community called Photography Without Borders. And I know I wouldn't be here today doing what I do if it wasn't for Johnny and Carmen. I remember as a college student, uh, as a Latino, trying to discover himself, I ran into issues where people would judge me because my Spanish wasn't good enough and uh, where I came from, that I was born here. I never got that from Johnny or Carmen. All I got was support, uh, understanding, and as a result, a few years later, I ended up getting volunteering for Tayed and being involved with the board. And fast forward a bunch of years later, now I'm um, doing my best to follow in their footsteps. So thank you so much, Johnny. Thank you so much, Carmen, for lighting the way for me, and not just me, but many other la young Latinos along the way. Love you both. Un aplauso, gracias, Tony. Tony is a person that is also documenting the history of this community, and he's been photographing uh, for many, many years and also teaching our kids uh, the art of photography. And so we say thank you, gracias to Tony Rocco for the work that he has done. Today, I think it's an example also of uh, our history. This is oral history, live oral history. Uh, I remember back in when I came, and I can't even remember this too, that you was conducting a project called Batiendo la Olla, Stirring the Pot. 
which is a saying like in Spanish we say nobody knows what's in the pot except the person that is doing the steering. And at that point, uh, there were Puerto Rican kids interviewing their elders about, you know, the moving to Philly from Puerto Rico. All those, uh, and we came and we helped with uh, some of the interviewing. I did some of them and also transcribing uh, the interviews. And those uh, tapes are placed at the, are they still at the Philadelphia Free Library, the branch here on uh, Lehigh and Masher, or six and, Ma and Lehigh. Oh, they're back here at, the, at this place. Also, they are here, place here at Sayed. And that project is quite a good resource for those who want to do research and to expand on the, of what the information and the documents that we have in, on those tapes. So, uh, but this is an example also of library history. Carmen? <coughs> so, um, I'm, I'm gonna take my mask off because I think that when I speak, it's not oh, as there. clear <laughs> um, for, for the audience uh, uh, you know, that is uh, virtual. I, I just wanna mention, you know, so J Johnny has talked about a lot of the battles he, he played uh, and, and the programming that he's done as executive director. I'd like to mention some of the um, battles that we have to continue to play. One of the things that, that Luis mentioned is when he was at the Philadelphia Foundation, how the Philadelphia doesn't look as quality programming, the, the kind of you know, work, um, t training work and teaching work that we do you know, with kids. And, and now um, we are working inside um, seven or eight schools every year, teaching over 2,000 kids, and every single time when we measure the outcomes of that program, the kids do better in literacy scores, they do better in socialization, and on and on and on consistently. And we do one 45-minute class 25 uh, weeks out of the year. So with that minimum intervention, we can produce those results just by teaching culturally focused art to kids. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, but, but we've had to fight a lot of battles and one is precisely that, is, is the argument that a center like Taller that is multidisciplinary, that has art classes, but it also has a gallery and it also has, uh, you know, theater and literature programs, et cetera, et cetera, is the kind of art and organization that needs to happen in communities like ours. And finally, the William Penn Foundation has seen the light. They now have an initiative that precisely is going to fund specifically organizations like ours, because in order for us to receive funding from the William Penn Foundation, <laughs> You had to be a single model or a single um, modality entity. So if you were a gallery, you had to show, you had to demonstrate that 75% of your programming was visual arts, nothing else. If you were a theater, 75% had to be a theater. If you were, you know, whatever it was, whatever discipline it was, it needed to include 75% except in art education where we could you know, barely uh, fit in in arts education because that was a discipline. Well, now they've understood that multidisciplinary art centers. <laughs> 2021, and I was talking back when it was 1980 something, 1970 something. So this is a so one. It's still a struggle. It's finally a one battle. Of course, you know, there were many, many battles to, to win for, you know, to, to be able to accomplish this this building, and one particular one that I remember, it, you know, I will never, <laughs> because, you know, um, I was spoken to as if I were an ignorant uh, individual that didn't know what she was doing. So in a meeting with the Commerce Department, and, and thanks to the generosity uh, of the, actually this happened through on the street administration, 
we received one and a half million dollars that were the initial funding for the building. And it was very flexible money, so it allowed us to do a marketing feasibility study. It allowed us to hire architects. So we had, all, you know, with that money, we were able to figure out the space we needed, have a clear idea, more or less have an idea of the scope of the project and how much it was going to cost, and do a feasibility study. Well, um, we then received other funding from the state, but the city kept pushing and pushing and pushing because they thought that nothing was happening. Um, and their, their sense was that, you know, if you already have seven and a half million dollars and the project is 10 or 10 and a half million dollars, get a loan of the last three and a half million dollars and just get the building done. Well, knowing and understanding the example of the Kimmel Center, the Please Touch Museum and other museums who got so indebted in order to finish their buildings that for years they struggled in order to get out of debt, I said, no, uh. <laughs> and at that point, when we needed the last three, three and a half million dollars of funding, we figured out that our project was an excellent example to qualify for new market tax credits. Where at that meeting, the director of the office, I'm not gonna mention names, who was a banker, said, well, I'm a banker, and I'm not gonna, I don't think Taller qualifies for a new market tax credit. <laughs> And I said, well, I'm glad that you're not the banker I'm going to go to. Because, <laughs> because we were able to get an approval for new market tax credits, which you know was the funding we needed to finish the project. Um, the thing is that after <laughs> the building was finished, <laughs> and uh, you know, there's a nice picture that the Al Aldea paper put put out with in a facade with me in front of the of the of the sign up front and so on and so forth. Even months later, I get in an envelope the, a folded uh, copy of the picture and said, "Carmen, you've made a believer out of me." So <laughs> there's, there's plenty of battles that need to be fought in order to continue the struggle. But, um, but yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, some of them end well, and some of them, you know, y y they're they're difficult to to swallow and to and to understand. You know, one of the stories that I have about the building as well is that we all also qualified for this national funding strategy that was specific for capital projects, and. All we were asking for was for $350,000 out of an $11.5 million project. And you know why they rejected that project? Because we did not have enough funding. Now, at that point, we had already identified almost $8 million in funding, and the, and the reason why they rejected it is because they did not believe, nor did they check, that the funding from the state had been already approved. It was unbelievable. <laughs> so, th but this is the kind of stuff that you know that happens, and there's nothing you can do about it. And for unfortunately, I with funders, you can't really uh, prove what went into those decisions because it's all done under closed doors, and nobody really knows what the analysis is. I I heard about this because I talked to the program officer, and that's what he told me, but he was not going to put that in writing. Anyway, I wanted to check. But I, I also want to check another thing, because it connects to the oral history project and how, you know, a lot of the work that, that we do builds on work that has been done before, you know, under Johnny's, you know, 12th uh, initial hi history uh, as executive director. But the oral history project uh, created uh, the conditions and, and elements and, and content for the historical society to have interest in doing a collaboration with Taller. And in a two-year project, we eventually, you know, after meetings and, and there were 20 uh, individuals that were selected from both communities, from uh, the historical society and from Taller, 
to be community um, archivists, we agreed to put together a website that is about the Puerto Rican history, the migration of Puerto Rican history into Philadelphia from beginning to now. So that's a website that is active that people can visit. You um, Google Neighbors HSP and the, the, the uh, website Neighbors comes up and there's a lot of incredible information, a lot of which came out of the information that we have in our archives as well as in the uh, Historical Society archives. And in that battle, we never relinquish our principles. So, that was also, you know, principles of our funding, yes, money, yes, but we always stand behind our principles. And that shows why we're still here. Johnny, how do you, <laughs> how do you envision, before we open it to, uh, to the audience, how do you envision the future of uh, that years? Envision it. Wow. I, uh, you know, one thing I learned is n when we leave, we can trust the uh, youth, you know, the next generation to, to take it wherever it needs to get, right? Uh, Carmen did the heroic work of fighting with funders and getting this amazing facility. Um, and I have the great honor of having a one-man show uh, which I didn't even dream of, right? Um, but if God gave me more years after retiring, you know, I got to do something with that. And, and that's what, you know, I think that's the future, right? I think that we always had young artists, even in the programming today, right? Take the lead and do amazing things like the graffiti shows where they led the process, drove us crazy, Julia, and, you know, the stuff with the, uh, with like Doris did with the school of the, of the, of the deaf and blind. Um, and and just, just so many, I think the archives, I just wanted to end with one thing, that, that it really, collaborations to me, you know, people working together and putting aside the crap and looking at common ground um, and getting from at least A to B Right, and then getting to maybe C and D later, that's what's going to happen here, you know? The young, they have a young staff, you know? Plus, they have people working here that will volunteer parents when, you know, modeling over there, you know, her kids grew up with my kids, Adela, who else used to work here <laughs> when I was there? But Dorita, you know, um, there was just so much, you know, history there, right? And I can't, I can't end without saying how grateful I am to the future generations. I've had the luxury and the honor of working with young people in education, and they always taught me way more, you know? Um, the people in the street taught me way more. The Edwin Desmores of the world taught me way more than I ever thought capable of understanding, right? Yeah, I thought about this activity when I was uh, yesterday, I said, uh, now we're all the elder, the elders of this community. We are in that, we're like relaying, this is like a symbolic rise of passage. And we're like saying, you know, now we took Tayyip to this uh, level, to the next generation and the new leaders in the, as cultural workers the little ones who will continue uh, the work. And we're here also to help and assist the work that they do. I mean, we're not moving away. We're still collaborating and the knowledge that we have, the history that we have, the shared history that we have is for us to contribute and to share with others. And now so I know so that Luis, there is I, ha I do, have, I do have one I'm more sorry. comment uh, very quickly um, <laughs> about the future, which is the connection that Taller has made with Inter-American University from Puerto Rico. This is, you know, this is something big, something that is, you know, still in its, in its nascent uh, shape, but, um, but something that has an incredible potential into the future and, and that will connect youth with 
education, with culture, and with taller. So we're very excited. I'm very excited, <laughs> and I'm I, you know I'm I'm sorry I'm not 25 years younger and can see it. <laughs> I know that, uh, I'm sorry, we have some questions here that, uh, from the audience. And we also, uh, I know Julia has a testimonial, so we're going to have a live testimonial from Julia, uh, who has a very long history with Tayyip. You can do it now, Julia, yes, the mic is here. Hello, hola, ¿cómo están? Todo bien chévere, ¿verdad? Chévere. Okay, so, um, mic? Yeah. Okay, so Johnny asked me to think of uh, some memories, but I put together a text to myself, and I'm going to start, and I'll just do this now. <clears throat> Memories. Like the corners of my mind, misty watercolored memories of the way we were. I was fresh out of college when I visited Tayed for the first time. Luis Hernandez was bookstore manager, was the bookstore manager, and playing Latin music albums on a record player. <laughs> I explored the bookstore asked questions, probably didn't buy anything, yet. It was the first time since my move to Philly that I felt I was home. Tayel Puerto Riqueño, how do I remember thee? Let me count the ways. One, my first day at work, I was feeling kind of sick. Carmen Febo was called in to see what was wrong with me. She put a she put a uh, thermometer and a tongue in my mouth, then the thermometer and com and confirmed that I had strep throat. So my first day, I was sent home. <laughs> Two, what I remember. When I fell in love with the boxer who happened to be the son of the director of the movie La Operación. Three the older man who just came out of jail was released through the Innocence Project and shared the 10,000 decimas he wrote when he was inside. Remember that, Johnny? <laughs> the graffiti show, Lucky, the local drug dealer, attended, dressed to the nines and wearing a fedora hat. Rafka's exhibit and a stray dog attended and Frank El Romantico sang. <laughs> When Tufino, four, when Tufino's daughter exhibited and he attended the opening. Sometimes I think this memory was just in my imagination. Was it? I don't know. <laughs> five, Carlos Re Santana retrospective. In those days, the Mexican community wasn't as prominent or visible in North Philly. But when Carlos arrived, it felt like all of Mexico came to greet him. Six, when Las Gallas exhibited at Taller Puerto Rican. Seven, the Puerto Rican collection of original Christmas cards exhibit. And my friend Sylvia was on, and then my friend Sylvia came um, from, co from college and was on the, then she was on the cover of the Inquirer the next day. <laughs> eight, the way, oh, eight, and he's not here today, eight. The day we met Danny Torres. He set up his easel and started painting right outside the entrance of Tayed. Danny, I remember we, when we represented Tayed at the Yellow Springs Institute and we met Felipe Edinburgh and Yolanda Lopez and other Latino artists from throughout the US and Latino America. I remember when at that, at that um, conference, I helped Danny with his performance. It was about 
being born. And I remember oiling his naked body, putting him in a black garbage bag so he could recreate the birth process. <laughs> it's true. This is very true. I'm sorry he's not here. Nine. I remember when Luis Sanabria arrived and I became a revolutionary. And I, and I became part of a movement that worked towards and witnessed the release and freedom of the Puerto Rican political prisoners and prisoners of war. This was also the time when I, oh yeah, war. Yes, please. And also, this was also the time when I became a feminist. You can, you know. Think about that. 10, I remember the man who made a castle out of popsicle sticks. Do you remember that? And then we put it like up on the shelf at the, at the at Tayer. 11, and the older man who just came out at, okay, and the older man who just came out of prison after spending me, oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry. 11, and the older man who just came out after spending many years in jail was released through the Innocence Project and when he shared the 10,000 decimas he wrote when he was inside. Mm -hmm. 12, I remember Jose Alicea's opening, <sighs> opening reception, and when I told Johnny that I wanted to marry him. <laughs> Taller Puerto Ricano, how do I remember thee? Let me count the ways. P.S. I used to read my poetry off from a piece of paper. Now, not so much. Thank you. Bien, gracias, Julia. Thank you, Julia. Gracias, Julia. I have uh, three questions here from the audience. One of them is from Maria Rodriguez, Journey. Do you remember teaching art in a garage in the back of a church on Fifth and Clearfield in the late 1970s? I was one of his students back then. My mom, Altagracia Boscana, became a volunteer at Taller later on. Journey also helped me filled out the admissions papers to go to the University of the Arts. I want to say thank you to him for, for being an inspiration all these years. Do you remember? Gracias, Maria. And I do remember your mother too, Altagracia Buscana, yes. Another one, are there kids in the Tire Puerto Rican after school programs who have been Never been to Puerto Rico? If so, how could they learn about the beauty and variety of this island, La Isla, their heritage? I mean, yeah, um, <laughs> there are uh, kids and, you know, we try to teach them um, through imagery, through stories, through, I mean, Marilyn Rodriguez is the education director. You can uh, say more. <laughs> But let me s let me tell a little bit about about Marilyn's stories because the 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 person that that Johnny was talking about about somebody that was a parent and you know and is now working at Taller. So Marilyn started as a parent, became a parent advisor to the board of directors, became the board secretary, and when her kids who had been in the program and finished the program, her daughter went to Moore College of Art and finished a bachelor's degree in art history. Um, her, um, she decided to go back to school, finish an art degree at Moore College of Art, and then went to Baltimore and finished a master's degree in education, and now she is the director of Tayer's education program. So, so in Marilyn, we have three 
success stories because her son now, you know, manages a, a big department in a in a company, in a local company, and is you know is doing very well and 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 supporting his family. So Marilyn, how do kids learn about Puerto Rico? Recording this. a theme and last year our theme was resiliency through adversity we're going to continue that because it's important um, they're learning the basics of arts but they're also learning the history of a latino fighters and activists and that continues that's one of my pet peeves um, i make sure that our teachers are well informed and they're reading constantly and we're also incorporating literacy which is really really important right now i try to tie this to the arts in every form so again we do it constantly, and I'm always uh, playing music, or I'm having teachers playing music, and they're learning, you know, how to dance. This semester we're doing bachata and, and um, salsa, and then next year, if everything goes well, we're going to introduce music through digital world, because that's also happening, and the kids are going to learn how to do music through the laptop. Very good. And uh, we will continue to um, to work on a on a relationship with the Centro de Estudios Puertorriqueños in New York that has a lot of resources about Puerto Rican culture as well. This one is from Lucas Rivera. As cultural workers, we often become part of movement building in our communities. What cultural art movements are being cultivated today now that Taller has its new asset? Lucas wants to add that he misses them both dearly. Another success Luca story. Lucas Rivera. Oh, yes. Si. What was that? The question is, uh, what cultural art movements are being cultivated today now that Tayer has this new asset? He wants to add that he misses them both, both dearly. Both. I mean, Carmen could talk about today, but um, Lucas came to us because he could do, he, was, he, he himself was a, uh, a performance artist, writer, uh, visual artist, and, but he came and he said, and this is the way we would hire people, right, in those days. They'll come in and like Tony Rodriguez and, and Lucas Rivera, you know, Lucas comes in, tells me, hey, uh, I think uh, I want to teach capoeira to the kids. And I've learned it, I've trained for it. Um, and, you know, he said I can do, um, you know, an audition. And I said, no, then just teach it on Saturdays at 4 o'clock, okay? <laughs> um, and, and, you know, sat in and watched. And once I was convinced that the kids were loving it, you know, it's like Tony Rodriguez came in one day and he says, um, he's a fireman today and probably working. Um, and he said, um, hey, I, I know Akiro, or one of the styles, and, and um, I want to teach. And I said, well, then I don't know. I don't know anything about Akiro, so uh, yeah, teach it, but let's call it phys ed, right? Let's call it time for kids to develop their bodies and their minds and all that. But all of them knew that the story that was underground was the story of their lives, the story of their connection to Puerto Rico, to their heritage, to their culture. And that's the way, you know, we did it, right? Because kids don't want to sit in the classroom and listen to, you know, Johnny Sarri talk about the Tainos and the Japanese. You know, if they, they want to, you know, I had the great honor, invited by Marilyn and Rafael, to do a workshop ye uh, yesterday. Oh, my God. Yeah, yesterday. So I took them through the show, and we talked about folklore and folk tales and what they saw um, about nature. Um, and then when we came back, I had brought a bunch of stuff for them to do a three-dimensional piece with a going to work on because we didn't get that far. Uh, showed them how I carve and blah, blah, blah. And um, 
And then they started telling me, hey, so my mother is peruana, um, or something like that, and my dad is Arab, right? And we live in North Philly. And, and then, you know, they almost, f at least out of the, the six or seven were already rich heritage is a mixture, right? And then I say, well, you know, the Arabs language of North Africa is what influenced the Spanish after the, you know, the Moroccan dominance of, of what before what was we know today as Spain. Uh, so they weren't that great off either, right? And um, when they came to the America, anyway. So we got into that, and then she and I told her about the Spanish language. And I said, you know, there are about 4,000 words that come directly from Arabic origin into the Spanish word. And then we got into the Tainos because they asked. And then I said, you know, and then the, a young lady from the Dominican Republic said, yeah, I come from Seba. Is that a Taino name? And I said, absolutely. And then I said, you know, um, if you think of the Seba, and then we you know, talked about the sculpture that referenced to the Seba, about the, the underworld, the middle world, and then the above, right? And speaking of the future, right? Um, and that I left empty, right? It's just these branches coming out, right? Because the future, we, I guess we'll find out, right? Maybe. Um, but yeah, thank you for, for you know, Martin, for because the kids themselves started telling their own stories, and therefore, all I did was fill in, right? Oh, now that you mentioned that, you know, that you know that the Spanish language has four, you know, 4,000 words. And, uh, and that's the way we taught it. So, and, uh, <coughs> well, so to, to respond also to, to Lucas and, and movements that are happening now, right? So, <coughs> I, I'm not sure that, that uh, you know, what I'm going to mention is, is anything, uh, you know, like a specific movement. Um, but I can say that uh, Taller is influencing a lot of um, planting seeds that eventually, you know, germinate into, into something. So we've done 25 Schombergs. And this year we're going to explore at the Schomburg Symposium, and maybe Lucas should connect, to find out what has the impact that Schomburg has had over its 25 years. We know, for example, that Evelyn finished her PhD because of the influence of Schomburg Symposium. We know that Tamara Walker was another person that connected to Schomburg very early and finished uh, another PhD. We know that teachers come and social workers come and, and then take that information to their classrooms and continue. And we know that after 25 years of talking about specifically Afro-Latino and Afro-Puerto Rican presence in, you know, in our culture, in our, in, our, in our modern world, there is an acceptance of the term and no other people are starting to talk about Afro-Latinism and, uh, and Afro-Boricuanism, we should say. And also say. doing research. So it will be research, co uh, correct. Um, Let's hear from the audience uh, if they have any other questions or comments. Well, I, one more. So we're also, we're also you know, do an, uh, the Nertino uh, comic book uh, every year, and that is influencing you know, the classes that we're doing with our kids, with the teenage kids in, in, in comic making. And who knows, one of them may become you know, the next comic book star of the future. Any comments, questions, uh, any other member of the audience? Doris. Is that Doris? Doris, come to the front. Hey. Brazil. Now, I really hope I can talk and, and not cry. I'm already crying. <laughs> it's the fact that when I met Carmen and Luis, my husband, I mean, we came to Philadelphia because of family medicine. And Carmen was one of his uh, attending physicians at Hahnemann. So we moved to Philadelphia in 78. So I guess sometime in January, we had a dinner at Norma Rivera's house or something. And that's when they told me that um, 
you know, they found out I was an artist. Well, I'm here. I left everything in Brazil, blah, 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 blah. Well, we can use, you know, some volunteer work. And I started going to Talir at the old, old building. And, and I'll tell you, it was a really funky place, you know, on the second floor. If you needed to get something on the third floor where they kept, you had to walk like at the, on the edge of the, the room to pick something up. It was dangerous to step in the middle, you know. They were afraid something could happen. Yes, right, Luis, in the old, old building. But anyway, that's how I end up here. And then I started as a volunteer. And then uh, in 79, and then you went on in 94, I took Julia's place and all that. So I was more involved in the gallery, but the other times I was part of the curatorial committee. So I did a lot of wall painting of the gallery, a lot of hanging shows and all that. You know, the curatorial I, working committee. Yes, yes, yes. That's what Amy, Jared, and I, oh boy, we are good wall painters. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to just tell you two little stories because one is when, um, what was the artist's name, Carmen? That um, every two years uh, we would invite a, 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 a fine artist from Puerto Rico for a major show. Every, uh, every other year. But then whatever she did, she came in the fall. And, um, and the one that designed our beautiful commemoratory poster. Um, oh, Jesus. I, you know, with the building. It will come and, to me. Yes. Yeah, it will come to me too. So anyway, uh, she was so taken by the fall because she has really never seen it. Guys, she walked around. She, she had her beautiful prints, but she decided to do an installation. So she collected all the leaves around, and she did this awesome thing with fall leaves and all that. It was great, right? Until the next day when I get to work, our building person had very carefully swept all the leaves. <laughs> from the installation <laughs> because he was so, I don't, whatever his name was, that cute, yeah, yeah. Oh, he cleaned the gallery so well and it's like, you know, you know but, but everything was gone and oh my gosh. And then we, that was a funny gallery story. And the other one that came to mind when we are talking about I, now. I think it's Isabel Vasquez. Oh, yes. Yes, and, then, and when we are talking about the kids that have never been to Puerto Rico, you know, but they know and they learn it. Well, here's another, another little gallery story. We had a beautiful exhibition, and I did a tour. You know, they asked me, would you do a tour with a group of, I don't know, from where, I think it was even our after-school kids, I don't remember. So I took, and we talked about the ocean, and, and, and what, inspired by the art, you know, whatever was hanging there. And I told them, we all sit down. Let's close our eyes. Now we're going to go to the beach in Luquillo. We're going to get, get our towels. Don't forget your towels. Get, and they are all with their eyes closed. And we are going to the beach. And we blah, 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 blah. It was a success until the next day. <laughs> A parent showed up, guys, really worried about, you know, my kid, you, you went to the, you didn't have permission to go to the beach, and, 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 then, and they said they put their bathing suits on, and they want to know who, it, and I said, sir, nobody went, it's January. <laughs> Even if I wanted to, you know, abuse a kid, I mean, it's January, you know. That way, it was so vivid, you know, and it was such a beautiful exhibition. And I, I mean, it was so, that's how inspiring. So they, a lot of them did go to Puerto Rico. Okay, good, Doris. <laughs> Nobody else? Anybody else? Well, we're, there's somebody? Yeah. Come on to front. My name is Linda Stevenson, and I um, am a professor at Westchester, and um, 
I just want to say thank you so much for all the inspiration you've given to the region. Um, we have 13 years of Latino Communities Conference um, that is going to happen again next week on Wednesday. We uh, welcome all of you to come. It's going to be virtual, so just hop on our website and it's for free. Uh, bring all your friends, bring them from the region. Um, Johnny is um, a mentor for me and, and as a professor starting in Latino politics with an experiential component to reach from Westchester to Norristown to Kennett Square to Philadelphia to Tony's studios to Tony's students to him dancing with his mom at one of our events that I'll never forget. And just I just want to say in terms of the future, it's very bright because there's so many students who have been inspired and professors who keep pulling your resources and I just want to thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. Nobody else? Anybody else? The lady here? Hi, my name is Linda Morales. I am originally a New Yorker. This is part of my tale. Um, I came to Philadelphia in 84 to work as a, uh, in Action News, um, Channel 6, and eventually um, started editing for Visions. And this is how I met Carmen and Johnny. Um, I think you guys were just starting <laughs> your collaboration. And I remember the very first um, exhibit that I met Carmen, I hope you still have a copy of it, was the, Ta the Taino exhibit. So uh, being Puerto Rican, um, I learned a little bit, you know, not even really a whole lot, just knowing that I'm from Puerto Rico, my mother came here and she wants to go back. Um, and not really anything else, because you don't learn it in school. So, so not only, um, the reason why I wanted to say something is because not only are you teaching children, but you're teaching adults. I was taken, I was just fascinated. If you remember, I was so into that exhibit. I'm like, oh my God, like she walked me through the whole thing. Um, I think I put together like a, a really good program, but of course, a uh, part of my goal was to try to make sure that um, the Philadelphia would learn about the Latino community and this wonderful, wonderful place, um, Tayel. When I lived in New York, everywhere I lived in New York, in Brooklyn and Long Island, I was surrounded by Puerto Ricanos. I come to Philadelphia and they're like, oh, they live in North Philly. I'm like in, in Germantown and don't see my people. And so that was like a gift for me. And, um, and just kept coming back because I kept wanting to share our community, like anything I could, I, I could get our station to, to air. <laughs> you know, oh, Taya's doing something, and you did the, the Friday night arts. I did that, and then of course, um, I had like three great stories, and the station wanted to put them all together in one, and I was horrified. I was just like, no, this is three stories. And, but I just remember coming back for the paranda, and, and it was just always such a pleasure and, and appreciate it. And to this day, I still come down when I have people visiting. I had a friend from, um, she's Mexican, um, and her, I was friends with her son. They're from California. She lived in Arizona, and I brought her down. She was like, oh my God, I would always come down. Like, you got to see the community. You got to come to Tayen. So it's still very big in my heart. And my connection with Johnny, both of you, all those years and going to all of, you know, any events and trying to get the news to go out there, I'd be like, I'm going to let them know so we make sure that we get coverage. Um, and, you know, it's just been great. And I hope that it continues. I brought my children and continue to bring my friends' children. And um, thank you so much to both of you. It's been a pleasure knowing you. I'm, we're still going to know each other and hopefully still be in contact. Um, so, gracias. Mi corazón. Thank you. Gracias. 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 Anybody else? Anybody else? No. We're we're running over. So yeah, we need. Uh, if, if there is uh, anything in the chat that that anything, because if not, uh, we're gonna. Any questions? You know, do we have some some refreshments outside? So, I want to thank you all and and all of those that have joined us uh, in the. In the virtual, in the Gracias virtual connection. Yet. Thank you. Thank you for. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to, you know, thank Luis for uh, for being a.
the master of ceremonies that I knew he was going to be? Doesn't he have a really, really locutorial voice? <laughs> yeah. But I knew his connection with Taller and his history with Taller was going to be very useful today. So thank you, Luis. And, and he's, she's my dancing partner, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we couldn't do any dancing today. Other, another day. And, and Johnny Irizarry, thank you for saying Gracias, yes, Johnny, Josie. to me so many years ago. Gracias. Um, remember you know, that this is going to be recorded, so if you know of people that may want to, to see it, uh, it, it, you know, once it gets cleaned up a little bit, it will be posted in our website. Please share it with friends. Um, we will be sending out a survey for you to tell us how you enjoyed uh, and, and give us any, any suggestions. Please, please complete it. Every response is uh, confidential. Um, remember that Johnny's show is only going to be up for another week or so until October 1st. The next uh, show will open on October 22nd, Marina Gutierrez. Uh, the title of that is Another World Exists. Visit Taller PR for upcoming events and for any additional information. Visit our store, of course. And um, our sponsors, William Penn Foundation, Samuel Fells Fund, PICO, the Mellon Foundation, NEA, Pennsylvania Council, and the Andy Warhol Foundation. And let me tell you that Andy Warhol um, funds two organizations <laughs> on the East Coast, and one of them is Taller Puerto Rican. Wow. Thank you all for coming. Gracias, Enjoy. Gracias. Thank you to those that are online.